Good evening. Get all situated here. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you that we could gather here tonight. As I said already, Lord, I thank you for your word and the truth that you give to us. Lord, I'm thankful that we can come into your presence. Lord, I pray that you would meet with us now. I pray you'd give me the words to say, Lord. I pray you'd calm my nerves, clear my mind. Lord, I pray that you would cast out all distractions and that we'd be able to focus on you tonight. I pray that you would be honored and glorified with all that takes place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can go ahead and turn to the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 1. One of the easier minor prophets maybe to find. The last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 1. We're going to read the first five verses. Malachi chapter 1, verse 1 says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. And now when we first look at this at face value, when I, if I were to only have ever heard this from the Bible, knew nothing about God, never heard Scripture before, and then I read these five verses, I would get the impression that God loves some people and He hates others, right? That's what it says. I loved Esau, or excuse me, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. But that's not the case, and we we know that. God loves everyone, and let's start off by looking at that. If you turn to Acts chapter 10... Looking at how God loves everyone. Acts chapter 10. And in Acts chapter 10 we see a man named Cornelius who is saved. He comes to know Christ. Um, Let's jump to verse 34 here. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So we see here Cornelius is saved. We see here Peter realizes that Gentiles can be saved as well as Jews. He hadn't seen this before. He wasn't aware of this prior to this. But here he sees that. But we see that God is not a respecter of persons. Uh, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Start in verse 14 here. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning here in fear, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead. And gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. We see here that Peter is writing to saved people. We know this. Um, If we look at verses 14 through 16 again, I know we just read them, but as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So not from your former lifestyle, not like how you used to be, but how you are now. He's writing to saints. 
And we see this as well as he, he starts out, he's talking about the elect in verse 2, speaking of the saints. We see here in verse 17 that God the Father is not a respecter of persons. Again, that's what we're looking at, right? God loves everyone. He doesn't have favorites. And while we're here, let's look at verse 19 again. Talking about these saints and how they were redeemed. How were they redeemed? By the precious blood of Christ, it says in verse 19. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And we, if we go back a verse before that, we see that they weren't redeemed by silver or gold. They weren't redeemed by tradition of men or from their vain lifestyles. It was by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's how we're redeemed. Let's go down to, uh, well actually we see here in these verses that God doesn't have favorites, right? That's what I'm getting at here. He's no respecter of persons. It's all based on how we respond to Christ. That's what God cares about. He loves us and we can be redeemed if we respond to him properly. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. The world, all of us. He loves me. He loves all of you. He loves the world. That's everyone that's ever been here. Everyone that's here now and everyone that ever will be, God loves them. Isn't that a thought? Turn to 2 Peter. Again, we might get the impression from that, the portion of Scripture we read in Malachi that God hates certain people, but He doesn't. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want any of us to perish. He doesn't want any of us to be destroyed, right? He doesn't hate us. He wants all to be saved. But we see in the scriptures also we do see what God does hate, right? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and following. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift and running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among brethren. We see here, here are some things that God Hates. Here are some sins that God especially hates. God hates our sin. He has to judge sin. Go to Romans chapter 8. Be jumping around a lot. Been, I've heard it called a Bible marathon before. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither there indeed can be. So we see here, here in our natural state, in our flesh, we are enemies with God. We do not naturally have fellowship with God. God loves us, but because of our sin we are separated from Him. That's what we're looking at here. And I find it interesting, back in Malachi where we started, verse one of, or excuse me, verse 4 of chapter 1, whereas Edom, these were descendants of Esau, saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness. See, call them the border of wickedness. He's pointing out their wickedness, first of all. And what else? The people against whom the Lord hath indignation who the Lord has anger against because of their wickedness. Our wickedness God hates. If we go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, Christ says, But go ye and learn what that meaneth. 
I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He came to call sinners to repentance. He loves sinners. He will not have sacrifice, but mercy. There's nothing we can bring to the table when it comes to God. He already loves us. And no matter what we do, our sin always stains it. He hates our sin. Again, we're looking at the fact that God does not uh, just choose... Some people think that's what elect means. Just chooses, I'm going to hate and condemn that person, but I'm going to love this person for whatever reason. No, that's not how God operates. And we can go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Start in verse 10. Romans 9. Chapter 9, verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. And in these verses we see this election. This, like I said, it's not just God picking individuals and rejecting others who will go to heaven and who will not. It is based on his foreknowledge. We see this in verse 12. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. And that just reminds us that Christ knows, God knows everything. He knew that the elder would serve the younger. God knows everything. The same is with salvation, right? Let's go to Revelation chapter 13 and just looking at God's foreknowledge. Revelation chapter 13. Verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Slain from the foundation of the world. And we see this again in chapter 17 of Revelation. Very similar. 17 of Revelation, verse, verse 8. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. I'm just going to stop there. From the foundation of the world. Back in First Peter, we read and we saw the word for ordained, to have knowledge beforehand. So what is this talking about here? It's talking about before anything was ever made, Christ knew sin would come into the world, and he made a way for us to be saved through Jesus Christ. He knew it was coming. He knows everything, right? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Chosen us. What is that, what's it talking about here? How, does, how do, does one become the elect? When it speaks of the elect, God knows they're going to trust in Christ for salvation. In that sense, he... he chose them maybe he chose a way for people to be saved and he knows who's going to be saved you understand what i'm saying here so god knows everything so god knew that sin would enter the world he knew um, that sin can't come into heaven obviously so through faith in jesus with a repentant heart we can be saved that's the 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 um, solution that god came up with and the lord also knows who will respond uh, properly to that invitation that's what is going on back in, in Romans 9. Let's turn there again. Romans chapter 9. Talking about the election. And how he said that the older shall serve the younger. Let's go to Genesis 25. And we'll look at this. Genesis chapter 25. Verse 19. 
And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Naram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went, in, went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Again, this is what um, Paul is writing about in Romans chapter 9. Let's go to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. Verse 28, And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. The Lord speaking to Jacob, Esau's younger brother. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. So we see here, and we know this, that Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and that the 12 tribes of Israel descended from Jacob, or Israel, right? God changes his name here. We see this. Um, let's go, and, and I was thinking of this, I was thinking of God's foreknowledge, and how he knows everything, and how he accomplishes his purposes. Let's go to Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah. Chapter 1, and we see this here with Jeremiah. Verse 5, the Lord is speaking to him, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And the same took place with Jacob before he was born. God had a purpose for him. He knew what would happen. He knew what needed to take place, and he chose Jacob to be be the, the father of his people, for the twelve tribes of Israel to descend from him. Let's go back to Romans here. Romans chapter 9. And here we see Paul quoting from Malachi in verse 13, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And here's what we're considering here. Here's what I mentioned at the beginning. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, of course not. There is no unrighteousness with God. There's no sin with God. And that's what we're looking at here. And, and he even asks that question. And then moving on in verse 15, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. And I was thinking of this, what, what happened with Pharaoh? What happened with Pharaoh before Israel was taken out? Right? God knew that Pharaoh would reject truth, that he wouldn't let the people go until the last plague, but he knew he wouldn't be a follower of him, but God still used him to accomplish his purposes, right? He still was able to accomplish his purposes in spite of Pharaoh. It was not a problem for him. Let's go, let's go to Jeremiah 18 here. Jeremiah 18, and we see what it's all about here. We understand God. He loves all. We understand his foreknowledge. There's no unrighteousness with him. We understand that he accomplishes his purposes. What's, what's our part? Man's part. Jeremiah 18, verse 1 and following. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the, on the wheels. 
And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation, and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So we see here, it all depends on how we respond to God, right? God's saying it doesn't, <clears throat> I don't, he doesn't, he doesn't look at this individual and condemn them and have mercy on this one. No, if, if, if they're doing good, he'll bless them. He'll have mercy on them. But like it says here, if they start doing evil, that, that, that changes. God responds to them based on how they respond to him. Does that make sense? You get what I'm saying? If, if we'll, we'll get there. Um, it's all about our response to God. Go back to Romans chapter 9. not trying to beat the horse to death, but trying to make it clear. Romans chapter 9, verse 18, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. And again, remember, we, we read in Exodus how he hardened Pharaoh's heart. What did he do? He made him make a decision, right? And we can either be tender to God, or we can dig our heels in, and our heart will become hard. We can be hardened. That's not God making our heart hard. That's us choosing to Harden our heart towards God. Does that make sense? It's all about how we respond to God. Um, in Malachi, again, chapter 1, we don't have time to, to go there, but I'll just briefly mention uh, verse 3. I'll read it again. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Um, if we had time, we'd go to Jeremiah 49. You can read through Jeremiah 49, and a good chunk of that chapter is talking about how he brought Edom down, the descendants of Esau, and, and how he, he, he judged them. But we see again, see also in Hebrews chapter 12, this strong language towards Esau. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. With me, please. You don't have to, but Hebrews chapter 12. And I would like to, we're not going to, I'd like to start at verse 1 and kind of work our way to where it talks about Esau here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before, us, set before us. So we are to put off any sin in our lives. We are to put off any weights. Those might not be sin, but they keep us from running the race as we ought to. We are to put those things off. How, the logical question, how do we do that? How do we know what to put off and what not to? Uh, go to James Chapter 1, verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted, meaning living, the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. How do we know? We, we spend time in God's word and allow him to speak to us, right? And we don't harden our hearts to him, right? We ask him to show us, but his word will reveal that to us. Go back to Hebrews chapter 4. Let's go to chapter 4 here. Speaking of God's word, you can... 
many of you probably have it memorized. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word can break up that in our heart. It can speak to us. God's word shows us what we need to put off, what we ought to do. Yes, there's the Ten Commandments, but more than that, he, he guides us through his word. Aren't you thankful that he can speak to us like that? That he can show us what we need to do? We wouldn't be able to figure it out ourselves. Let's go to, back to Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 2. So lay aside the weights and the sin. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of, of the throne of God. So while we're putting aside these weights and the sin, we are to look to Jesus, right? Look to him as we do that. Verse 3, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So while we're looking to Christ, consider what Christ endured. And consider, maybe more importantly, what he accomplished by doing that, right? We can be saved through him, and we can have a victorious lifestyle because of what he accomplished. Consider Christ and look to him. Uh, go back to Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 13. Pick up where we left off earlier. Verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So as the Lord shows us what we ought to be laying off, as he shows us what we ought to be doing, we need to come to him, come to the throne of grace and ask him to help us. And remember, he, he knows what it's like. He understands what we're going through. He's been there. He's been there. Go to 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 5. Oh, let me second Peter. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Again, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He cares for you. Cast all your care upon him. What, what, what are you carrying tonight? Do you need to be saved? Come to Jesus. Cast that care upon his feet. Are you confused about a direction in your life and what to do? Cast that at Jesus' feet. Come to him. He cares. Humble yourself. It, it requires us to acknowledge we don't have the answers. I don't know what to do, Lord. Help me. Maybe I know what to do, but I, I can't achieve it. Lord, help me. You should come to Christ. Back in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, we're not going to read through the verses 5 through 13, but he talks about chastisement, uh, about correction, and how those who know Christ, who are saved, are corrected by God. If you're not corrected... You, it tells us you're a bastard. You don't have a heavenly father if you're not corrected by God. And it also tells us, let's go to verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. It doesn't feel good to be corrected. But even that we should ask for it because it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It's Christ making us what we need to be. Maybe breaking us down so he can build us back up, maybe, if you understand what I'm saying there. Let's go to verse 
in Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Just to find some, some words here. In verse 15, looking diligently, beware. He's saying beware. Beware of what? About the root of bitterness springing up. That may trouble you. That word trouble, I looked it up. It means to, where is it? To excite, disturb, or annoy. That sounds like bitterness, right? I know uh, Pastor Ethan Custer not too long ago preached a little bit on bitterness. And when you see someone, if you're bitter and you see that individual or think about that individual and you start getting all worked up and angry and hot, you're probably bitter towards them. It's a sign of bitterness. We ought to beware of that. I don't have any reason to believe this, but I would ask, are you bitter tonight for some reason or against somebody? Beware. Might fail of the grace of God. That means to come late or to fall short at the end. And of course, we know many are defiled, polluted, contaminated with a bitter person when we're bitter. You know, how does bitterness start? I, maybe I won't be dogmatic, but sometimes anyway, bitterness starts when we get hurt, right? And we don't deal with that hurt properly, right? Go back to Genesis 25. We're going to get hurt. We've all been hurt. But what do we do with that hurt? Genesis 25, verse 29. Now this is, we're looking at Jacob and Esau, right? Verse 29, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? So we know he sold his birthright to Jacob for some pottage. Go to chapter 27. Verse 6. Chapter 27, verse 6. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau. Now this is after he, he stole the blessing, right? He deceived his father. Jacob deceived his father. His mother put him up to it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord, before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats. And I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, that he may bless thee before his death. And he does this. He does this. Go to verse 41. Afterwards, and Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. And then in verse, or excuse me, Genesis 28, so we see he's hurt, right? His brother's kind of been stabbing him in the back, right? Kind of taking advantage of him, working him over. Genesis chapter 28. Verse 6, so they send away Jacob because Esau wants to kill him. Genesis 28, verse 6, when Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take him a wife from thence, that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Paddan Aram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, 
Then went Esau unto Ishmael, and took unto, and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabajoth, to be his wife. So we see here, what was this all about? I think, I think he was bitter at Jacob. I think he was bitter at his father. And he just wanted, you know, he didn't deal with his hurt properly. He's going to stick it to his dad. He's going to get at him, right? I was thinking about shortly after I was saved, I, you know, I was at work and I was doing my job and I go around the corner and I, I heard this man I worked with, I heard him and we were talking, me and Brother Robbins with the teen boys on Sunday about how there will be mockers. Remember that? There will be mockers. And I heard this man mocking my faith with about 10 other individuals at my work. This is a man I respected. He respected me. We were, we're quite a bit alike, actually, in the good ways and the bad ways. And I, I heard him mocking me for my faith, and I just continued on. I just continued doing my job. And I was probably thinking at that time, you know, I probably handled it pretty well. You know, I didn't get up in his face. I didn't yell at him. You know, I didn't give him the what for. I didn't punch him in the face. So shortly being saved, I thought, hey, that's probably pretty good. I probably responded appropriately, right? Well, no, there's a lot of anger in my heart. And fast forward, I never dealt with it. Fast forward about four years, four years, carrying this, this anger. It was to the point where it was bitterness. I saw him and I was angry. I'd think about him and I was angry. Four years later, and I'm sitting there at my kitchen table studying, and the Lord's talking to me about anger. And he lays this man on my heart, and I just break down and just fall apart. I said, Lord, help me. Lord, I don't want to carry this around anymore. Lord, I don't want to be bitter. I want, Lord, help me to love him as I ought to. And this was my prayer for a while, and it wasn't a week, it wasn't overnight, it was probably a month or so, but guess what, that bitterness is gone now. I still see that man, and there's no bitterness there. You know why? Because I took it to the Lord. I casted my care upon the Lord. I took that bitterness and gave it to him, and he took it away. Now, I could have done that right away, right? That would have been the best way. It might have been hard, but keep praying. And I would suggest do that if you're dealing with something like that. But even if it's to the point where it seems like there's no remedy, take it to Christ, and he will fix it for you. Just a thought I had as I was looking at this bitterness and thinking of Esau and his bitterness, obviously, at his brother and father, and ultimately God, right? That's who we're angry with, really. Let's go back to Hebrews here. We'll continue on. Hebrews chapter 12. I think often when I think of casting my care upon the Lord, I think of... um, I'm dealing with financial issues or, or, you know, whatever. My situation isn't the best. But sometimes we need to bring our sin to him and let him cleanse us. Hebrews chapter 12. And we get to verse 16 and it starts talking about Esau. Remember we started off how he loved Jacob and hated Esau? lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And we just read that. A fornicator, we know what that is. Someone who indulges in unlawful, immoral behavior. That's a fornicator. A profane person, someone who is unhallowed or ungodly. Again, very strong language when it comes to talking about Esau here. Go to Genesis 25 again. Maybe your Bible just opens there by now. Genesis chapter 25. Verse 34. Then Jacob, verse 34, then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, 
And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. To hold in contempt or disdain. To view as worthless. He wasn't thinking about the future. He was thinking about right now. And what he wanted. And what would feel good. And what would be good. And I know it's not a perfect analogy. But how often do we do this in our lives? Wake up in the morning, maybe I don't feel like praying, I'm tired, whatever. I'm just going to go back to bed and sleep in and I skip my devotions, my prayer time. I'm not thinking ahead. And in a way I'm saying that's worthless, it's not worth it, right? It's not worth spending time with the Lord this morning because I'm tired. Maybe there's something, some church ministry or something that, you know, I, I could be involved, the Lord wants me to be involved, but... That would cut into this thing, or this time, or whatever it is, right? So, ministry in that capacity isn't worth it. This is, it's worthless compared to this thing, whatever it is, right? How often do we do that sort of thing? Turn to John chapter 4. Verse 31. So this is after uh, Christ has met with the woman at the well and has been speaking with her. Verse 31, John chapter 4. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Excuse me, lost my place. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. This is the attitude we ought to have, whatever it may be. Christ, sinless, perfect God in human form, he always did that. He always did the will of the Father and that which pleased God. Always. And what is this desire? That there is nothing else more important than what the Lord would have me to do. And there is no one else more important than God, right? And I was thinking on this this morning at work as I'm wrapping cabinets in autopilot, thinking about this, thinking about tonight, thinking about the scriptures. And I came to the realization that in me, I don't perfectly do it by any means. Make sure I say this right. It's a lot easier for me to do God's will as opposed, or to please God rather than please others, right? That's easier. I don't always do it perfectly. It's easier to do that than it is to put the Lord before this guy, usually. I have a little harder time than that, usually. I'm, I can be pretty selfish. I'll just tell you that. Maybe you don't struggle with that at all. I don't know. But to Desire to do God's will above everything else. That's what I'm talking about here. We see that Esau was an ungodly man. That's what the scriptures tell us in Hebrews. He was a fornicator. I think he was a little caught up in the now instead of the later. Of course, God knew all this. So he had Jacob. And I don't know all the reasons why. I mean, that's an assumption I make. I don't know all of God's reasons. But... Is it possible? And I don't know if he was saved. I, I, I lean towards not, but I won't even, I don't know. But you might say, is it possible for us to be ungodly if we're saved? Well, of course it is. I won't turn there, but in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read about David's sin with Bathsheba, right? And we know what happened. He had an affair with her. She conceived. And then he had her husband killed, right? And what was that? That was just a series of bad choices, really, and I'm not making light of it, but that's what it was. He chose to take it easy instead of going to war, right? He chose to gaze upon her. When he saw the sin, he didn't look away. He looked upon it. He didn't leave or, or drop everything and flee from it, like Joseph. He chose to indulge in the flesh. He chose to try to fool Uriah, right? So he would think it was his child, and he chose to have Uriah killed, and then he chose to marry her. 
we can, he, he was a godly man, and, and he, he failed in this area. He made some bad choices, bad choice after bad choice after bad choice, and we see he repented. So it is possible for us to be bitter, for us to be ungodly, to act in this way. Go back to Hebrews quickly here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, speaking of Esau, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. We'll go to Genesis chapter 27. Verse 32. And this is after Jacob's left. And Esau comes with his, his venison to get his blessing from his father. And Isaac, his father, said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn, Esau. And Isaac, Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it me? Brought at me, and I have eaten of all before thou, and I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety, and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob, for he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? I see here, you know, in Hebrews 12, 17, For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. I see here that Esau couldn't change what had happened. And he did get a blessing, and he was blessed. And I have to wonder, I don't pretend to know all the reasons why, but I have to wonder if maybe some of this was because Esau had the wrong focus. I, maybe, I don't know. The temporal, the now, instead of the later. We see he was a fornicator and an ungodly man. Again, I don't want to make assumptions of why God chose Jacob. I don't know fully. But I just was thinking of this. Is this some of the reasons why? And when he would have wanted, I bet he would have wanted to go back, maybe, and change things if he could. And I'm not saying that was a possibility. But go to Numbers chapter 20. We've looked at this recently. Pastor was here not too long ago. Numbers chapter 20. Almost finished here. Thank you for your patience. Numbers chapter 20, verse 7. And we know the story. Moses has been going through the wilderness with the children of Israel. And they keep on murmuring and they keep on complaining. And I wish we were back in Egypt. I wish we had all that food. Or maybe it would have been better if we just died there. Why do we have to come all the way out here to die? Right? They're murmuring again. They need water. They're turning on Moses. Verse 7 of Numbers chapter 20. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother. And speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? 
And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because he believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Two different men, Esau and Moses. But what they chose to do, Moses here chose to disobey. He didn't do as God told him, and he couldn't go into the promised land. There was consequences. And we see that God blessed him, right? He allowed him to see the land. God forgave him. Moses is in heaven right now, but he made the wrong choice, and God said, no, you can't go in there, right? Talking about choices we make. I don't know about you, but I don't want to make the wrong choices and have God say, you know what? I'll still fellowship with you if you repent. I'll still bless you. I'll still be with you. But you know what? This thing that I had for you, you can't do it because you made the wrong choice. Let's not make the wrong choice. I, I mentioned bitterness. My personal experience with it. Let's take that to God, whatever it is. Let's take our faults to God and allow him to cleanse us, right? Casting our care upon him, whatever that, that may be. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you that you reveal our faults, that you show us them, and you allow us to bring them to you, Lord. I'm thankful that you have mercy on us. Father, I pray for your people. I pray you would help them with whatever it may be. Maybe nothing that I've even preached tonight, I don't know. But I pray you'd be with us if we, as we move forward, Lord. Please show us what we ought to bring to you. Help us, show us the right choices so we can make them. Be with us this week as we go forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Chris. We heard a lot tonight, a lot of different things in these men's lives, Jacob and Esau, to consider. Let it settle in. Think about it. Take time to, to ponder, self-examine. The Lord, the Lord has a lot, maybe a lot of different things to, to bring to our attention. But the takeaway for me is just to be sober about the choices I make because we have a lot of power with those and we need to make the right ones okay so let's think about it let's ask the lord to speak to us and let's encourage each other it's good to be here together tonight we'll be back here of course on sunday and i hope to see you all then but let's keep each other in your prayers let's go out and tell tell someone in our community in the next few days about the lord let's tell them about how their choices can make an eternity of difference if they choose the gospel Okay, let's live for the Lord. You're dismissed. Thank you.